One of the things that I learned as I was working on the book was how powerful communities are in shaping identity. Hmm. Uh, and that's one thing we can learn positively from the LGBTQ community. It's the, the community that has made it very, very powerful. And I think we make a mistake as Christians if we think we can simply out-argue the opposition or simply intellectually hold ourselves together at this point. I think churches need to be true communities. Well, good day, folks, and thank you for joining us on The Public Square and Everything in It. Uh, I like to think of this video cast as a thinking person's alternative to reading the National Enquirer. And uh, today it's our pleasure to welcome Carl Truman to the show. Uh, Dr. Truman, Carl is a theologian, church historian, and uh, I, I think a wickedly smart cultural an analyst and cultural critic. Uh, he was professor at Westminster Seminary, as many of you know, for years uh, before taking a teaching post at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. He's an ordained minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, contributes to First Things Magazine regularly, and co-hosts the Mortification of Spin podcast. So he's written a lot of books, and we're not going to talk about a lot of them today. We're going to talk about one of them. I can't do show and tell today. Normally, I uh, pick a book up and show it to you, but this book uh, will not be published until November. Uh, I read a pre-publication copy of it and endorsed it uh, as, I think, the, the best piece of cultural analysis written by a Protestant in the last half century. Uh, it was a very good book. Um, it's entitled The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution. Now, if you're considering whether or not to listen, I'll say this. Most books that I read, or many books that I've read, were not worth my time reading. But some books are really worth the time reading, and when a book is really worth the time reading, I outline it, and I did that. I wrote about a 15 to 20 page outline of the book so that I can sort of uh, capture the argument and, and use it in the future, and I think it'll be a part of my canon, if you will, of uh, uh, cultural commentary. So I wanna recommend that you go to amazon.com and pre-order, or lifeway.com and pre-order, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And uh, so, Carl, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so we're going to have a fascinating discussion today about expressive individualism, for those of you who are listening, and that is kind of the view that uh, the whole purpose of life is to be authentic, and the way to be authentic is to align our lives with our deepest desires. Uh, it's not what Scripture teaches us. Uh, and that the way to be a good society is to applaud other people when they align their lives with their deepest desires. And so this, this is what we're going to talk about today and how it's corrupted the West in general, and America in particular. But before we dive into that, I wanna ask Carl to tell us um, a little bit about yourself. Why are you, you're a smart guy, you have a PhD. Why have you chosen to align your life instead of aligning with your deepest desires, but align it with the teachings of uh, an ancient Jewish carpenter, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, <laughs> who was uh, crucified and rose from the dead. So um, why are you a convictional Christian? Why did you end up being a professor of theology? Uh, well, I grew up in the UK. Uh, I'm an Englishman, grew up in the West Country of England in Gloucestershire. Uh, became a, a Christian when sometime between the ages of 17 and 20. The year before I left for college, I went to hear uh, Billy Graham preach at a rally at a, a local football stadium in Bristol in the United Kingdom. Good friend from school took me there. Uh, and at some point during my undergraduate days, I think, that was when I started going to church. At some point during my undergraduate days, I became convinced of the, of the truth of Christianity, uh, repented of my sins and put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, since then, I've, uh, uh, I suppose most importantly, tried to be a good faithful member of my local church, uh, wherever I've been, uh, and uh, also had the, the great privilege and pleasure of being allowed to, uh, to study, first of all, church history and then teach church history at two British universities in there for uh, 16 oh. years at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. That's a good run. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, they finally caught up with me and I had to leave and go to Grove City College. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a pretty good run, 16 years at one institution, so maybe yeah. you'll get another yeah. 16 or more at Grove City. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you start your book off with a statement, and I want to read it, all right? You say, the origins, the origins of this book lie in my curiosity about how and why a particular statement has come to be regarded as coherent and meaningful. And that statement is, and I quote, I am a woman trapped in a man's body. So you kick off the book with that statement and let's just kick off the interview the same way. Uh, why did you start it this way? 
Well, in general terms, uh, I'm, I consider myself to be a historian, not a theologian, really, a sort of history, historian of ideas. And often a question that's asked of historians is, why do you like this particular period of history or that particular period of history? That's never been the interest for me. My interest has always been in, in why. Take me to any point in history or to any thinker, and the, the question for me is, why does this person think? Why does this society think and act the way that it does? So that's the sort of the general background to that. The other uh, part of it was uh, I became fascinated, must be five or six years ago now, with, with the whole transgender idea uh, on the grounds that it struck me that it had suddenly and rather rapidly moved through society, that even my neighbors in Philadelphia would regard the statement, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body as, as meaning something and being coherent. And I, uh, I'm convinced that 20, 30 years ago, that would not have been the case. So the question came up in my mind, what are all the changes that have to take place, both intellectually and the more sort of social cultural level, in order for that statement to become not just plausible, but but a, a, a statement of such self-evident truth that to deny it these days will render you subject to accusations of an irrational phobia. Combine that with the fact that I think transgenderism captures the, the quintessence in some ways of the cultural moment. All of these things came together for me to think, that'd be an interesting question to ask and to answer. And then I had the, the great fortune of, of getting a year on the James Madison program at Princeton University to work on this. So it was a sort of beautiful confluence of personal interest as a historian, political interest as a member of society, and the opportunity that was provided generously for me by, by Robbie George and, and the James Madison program. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, as you say, and as we've talked about on this show, for those of you listening, that we, we're seeing some attacks uh, for the folks who would like historic Christian teaching to go away. Um, it goes beyond historic Christian teaching, and it's a fundamental attack on creation order, on some of the most basic and self-evident aspects of the world's order that God uh, intends. Um, it goes against uh, gender distinctions, against um, sex and marriage. Marriage as God intended it, decouples sex from marriage, and then also reorganizes marriage into something God didn't intend, and it's just an attempt to recreate the world and recreate the self, to be a creator of some sort. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute rebellion against external authority. It, you know, there's nothing in some ways more authoritative than our physical bodies yeah. for who we are. They locate us in time and space, and they also give us our biological sex. Uh, to repudiate that is a, a remarkable, remarkable move. And for that move to be plausible is, is stunning. So then uh, let's say somebody says, you know, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body and uh, this is my identity. Why is it so very important right now uh, f for society to then affirm and even applaud that? Why, why, why does it matter? Why can't someone just say my name was Frank and now it's Sally, like it or not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be Sally? Yeah, I think that there you get to the whole issue of what you've already referred to as expressive individualism, but several hundred years now, it has been percolating through society and Western culture that for me to be a truly free person, for me to be truly authentic, for me to be truly me, uh, is for me to express outwardly that which I feel inwardly. And when you combine that with the the need also for me to be, to be recognized. It's not enough for me to express outwardly that which I feel inwardly. I also want to belong. Human beings, we want to be free, but we also want to belong. And to belong means that you, Bruce, you have to acknowledge me for who I think I am. If you refuse to do that, then you're excluding me. I cannot belong. And that becomes an act of, of political oppression, social oppression against me. The question, of course, is why is it this particular set of identities that have come to hold or to grip the public imagination in the way they have done. You know, if I would say to you, Bruce, I'm really Napoleon Bonaparte. All you can do to prove that that isn't the case is point to my body. You know, it's just not the body of Napoleon Bonaparte. And society would affirm you and support you. In that. It's okay to exclude me if I think I'm Napoleon Bonaparte. 
you're going to get me medical treatment. So why does my body not count when I claim to be Caroline rather than Carl? That's the, that's the nub of the question I'm trying to address in the book in some ways. Yeah, and when you're making your argument, so when you're doing intellectual history and tracing ideas, you can trace them, you can trace it back 20 years, you can trace it back 200, you can trace it back 2000. And uh, you chose to start with Rousseau. So can you tell us a little bit about why you made that choice? <laughs> well, on one level, it was kind of, it's a little bit arbitrary because as you say, you can go back indefinitely. You have to start somewhere. And I, I'm persuaded by Charles Taylor that the key shift or change in the way that Western people think about themselves really occurs at the end of the 18th century with what we now refer to as the Romantic Movement. And in order to understand the Romantic Movement, you have to get to grips with the man whose thinking inspired the Romantics, and that was Rousseau. I could have gone back further. Uh, I could have gone back to Descartes. Descartes is the man who focuses uh, knowledge on internal conviction, internal sense. But Rousseau, I think, is the man who, who gives the, the Cartesian inward turn a kind of emotional and cultural punch. Uh, in a way that Descartes didn't. And so Rousseau became the, I think, the obvious figure in some ways to start this narrative with, if I wanted to keep the book under a 1,000 pages. Yeah, so our folks, uh, thank you, Carl, for a moment. Folks, we're going to take a break for just a moment, uh, but don't leave us right after the break. We are going to discuss the triumph of the erotic, the triumph of the therapeutic, and the triumph of transgenderism. Stay with us. We'll be back right after the break. Hi there, friends. Thank you for joining me on the public square and everything in it. Now, in case you're a person interested in further studies, I want to take a moment to talk with you about our Doctor of Ministry, or DMIN, program. If you enter the DMIN program here at Southeastern, your studies will be facilitated, and I guarantee you, by a world-class faculty. And you will find yourself connected to a community of very sharp DMIN students who serve as pastors, missionaries, counselors, teachers, and in other ministry positions. Our DMIN programs are designed to produce students who are especially sharp and whose studies will enhance their ministries. For example, you might be interested in the DMIN in faith and culture. This DMIN track trains a student in theology, ethics, and apologetics, and is designed to help career ministers develop a, a deeper understanding not only of the Bible, but of our cultural context, so that the student can come more effectively bring the gospel into an interface with our secular age. Now, if you're interested in applying for the DMIN, or taking a look at our academic catalog, you can visit apply.sebts.edu or you can email us at admissions at sebts.edu. And we're back. We have been discussing expressive individualism, which is the view that the point of life is to be authentic and the way to be authentic is uh, to align our lives with our deepest desires and to expect society to approve of our choice and even applaud us. And then honestly, to also ameliorate the, the negative consequences that come after we have recreated ourselves in a way that's harmful. It's got its root in thinkers such as Rousseau and Freud. But we want to turn the corner now and talk a little bit about the triumph of the erotic, the triumph of the therapeutic, and the triumph of transgenderism. So uh, let's talk about the triumph of the erotic. What do you mean by that? Triumph of the erotic really is, is uh, the way in which sex, sexuality has become in many ways the, the guiding idea relative to human identity. Has it roots in, in Freud? What, what Freud does is Freud sort of sexualizes Rousseau. I argue in the book that he, he's also drawing, I think, from Dessart, Martin Dessart. Rousseau is the man who, who first of all says, you know, it's society that messes you up. Freud sexualizes that and says what society does is it it polices your sexuality in order to allow us to live together in a, a relatively civilized way. What happens in the 20th century is, is that point gets sort of politicized by the left. And they say, well, actually, the policing of, of sexuality is the way in which the iniquitous capitalist bourgeois system maintains itself and, and, and oppresses people. So what we need to do is, is blow apart the sexual codes of society. People are going to be free. We have to get rid of the, the sexual codes, the sexual restrictions. And that paves the way, really, for 1968 and, and the sexual revolution of the 1960s. 
the same time that penetrates into popular culture as well with the rise of, of Hugh Hefner and then onwards into the internet age, we see the, uh, the triumph of the pornographic. Uh, and while I don't think Hugh Hefner is motivated by high political ideals, I think Hugh Hefner is motivated by wanting to make money. What, what Hefner did was make pornography respectable and help to identify the idea of, of human fulfillment and human freedom with sexual fulfillment and sexual freedom. So the triumph of the erotic is, is really the way in which politically, philosophically, culturally, sex has moved to center stage. Uh, it's transformed the way we think about human identity, and it's transformed the way we think about things like oppression and freedom as well. Yeah, and so for those of you listening, uh, Carl, um, refers to Augusto de Noche, if I remember correctly, in his book. And, oh, yeah. and we've mentioned him on the show. And I wanted to remind you that Del Noche back in the 60s and 70s uh, was predicting that two uh, false ideologies would dominate the West for years to come, and that's scientism and eroticism. Scientism, you'll remember, is the belief that science is the only true way of knowing and therefore should be the cultural authority, and that religious ways of knowing should be whispered about and pro whispered about in the recesses of our homes but not brought into public. Scientism persecutes religion indirectly by uh, privatizing it. But eroticism, the other false ideology, he said, persecutes religion directly because it is fundamentally antithetical to historic Christian, Jewish, Muslim uh, orthodoxy. And so what he uh, predicted has come true. And in Carl's book, um, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, you can see an excellent exposition of that. I urge you to go and pre-order it right now. So we talked about the triumph of the erotic. What about the triumph of the therapeutic? I know that that is a riff off of uh, Philip Reif's excellent book from uh, decades ago. He's one of my favorite cultural critics. I mention him at least every other show. So tell us a little bit about Reif and a little bit about uh, this therapeutic culture that's arisen in the West. Reif's an interesting character. He's, as far as I can make out, he's a, he's a secu he was a secular Jew in his own personal religious life, uh, for want of a better term. But he was also a great Freud scholar. And one of the things he picked up from Freud was the, the idea that cultures are defined by the things which they forbid. What Reef sees taking place really in the latter part of the 20th century is uh, a move which places what he called the therapeutic at the heart of culture. And the therapeutic is the idea that uh, the purpose of life is to be found in in a sense of psychological satisfaction. It, it ties in with expressive individualism because, of course, you know, the idea of, of, of feeling satisfied psychologically internally is, is a powerfully expressive individual idea. And Reef saw the, the way that this was being achieved uh, as being the abandonment of uh, the old uh, taboos, the old uh, interdict the old sexual codes that were restricting people. I mean, Freud saw that in some ways as a good thing. Reef sees it as a good thing. Uh, what, he, what Reef is worried about is the abandonment of these, of these codes in the, in the name of allowing people to feel personally satisfied. And then later in his career, he develops that into a, a broader cultural analysis where he argues that, that culture is really the transmission of these uh, thou shalt not stand from generation to generation. That's what keeps society and culture going. And he raises the very interesting question of, well, in a, in a therapeutic society where the idea is that you and I should feel satisfied psychologically in the here and now, thou shalt not play no useful role and will be abandoned. And then that raises much deeper and broader questions about the transmission of culture from generation to generation? Does everything not become incredibly unstable uh, and volatile at that particular point? And it's yeah. hard when, sorry, you want to say, Bruce? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I love Reef's work. He's a pretty pessimistic guy, but I want to remind the audience that he did say, I think it was in the first volume of his trilogy, that the world awaits a people. And he didn't name that people, and we'll name it today, people of God. Uh, the world awaits a people who recover the, said something like the frightening beauty of the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. Yeah. And I think that is the task of God's people today is to be a community who um, 
shows, not just says, but shows the beauty of the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. That this is how we flourish under God's loving reign by, you know, conforming our lives to the moral order and to his revealed uh, uh, word in scripture. And Reef also talks about this concept of death works that, you know, uh, once um, sacred order has been severed from social order, cultural institutions and products bring um, death and decay instead of life and vitality. So let's talk about that in relation to transgenderism. Um, you talk about the triumph of transgenderism. Yeah. Um, and that it's an odd alliance, the LGBTQIA yeah. plus movement. Um, and it's internally incoherent, and yet it's been quite successful. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's undoubtedly been incredibly successful. In some ways, it's the great political success story of the last 50 years. I, I argue in the book that it's incoherent because the L... Uh, uh, the G and the B really uh, operate with a gender binary. They assume that there is a distinct difference between men and women, between males and, and females. And that, of course, tracks back to basic physiological differences. In the early days of the movement, uh, not even the L and the G got on because of the, the distinct biological differences between uh, men and women. We now have, I think, essentially a... a an alliance of convenience. It's, it's, it's united by its opposition to heteronormativity, the, the idea that heterosexual sexuality is to be normative. That's what unites it. Internally, I think the, the rejection of biological sex by the transgender and the queer branches of the LGBTQ are, are really uh, incoherent relative to what the L, the G, and the B traditionally stand for. The enemy of their enemy is their friend, I think, and that's what holds them together. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great way to put it. Um, so we've had a great interview so far today, and, uh, but for those of you who are listening, we've got one more question. It's a very important one. We'll close with this question, and I want you to hear uh, what Carl has to say, and that is, uh, will you take a minute to advise God's people living in, an, in the midst of an era of expressive individualism where even Christians, you know, all of us have been caught up in this and are infected in ways that we probably don't recognize. Um, you know, what's your advice on how to live and how to be kind of self-aware? It's, that's a, it's a tough question because we are moving into, I won't say unprecedented territory, but certainly territory that we haven't seen since the immediate post-apostolic era. I think the second century is probably the closest analog historically to where we are now. One of the things that I learned as I was working on the book was how powerful communities are in shaping identity. Hmm. Uh, and that's one thing we can learn positively from the LGBTQ community. It's the, the community that has made it very, very powerful. And I think we make a mistake as Christians if we think we can simply out-argue the opposition or simply intellectually hold ourselves together at this point. I think churches need to be true communities. Not only do we need the creed, not only do we need our, our theology, uh, we need our code and our, our cult as well. Yeah. We need to live lives that reflect that theology in terms of the things we do and the things we won't tolerate. And we need to uh, be supportive of each other. When Jesus says, you know, by this you shall know that, shall all men know that you're my disciples by the love you have for each other. What he's saying there is community is very potent, very important. Paul puts the negative when he says, you know, bad company corrupts morals. You know, that's the other side of it. We need to realize that our young people and we ourselves live in communities that are corrupting. And therefore, we need to make sure that the strongest community we belong to is the community of God's people, is the church. And that's more than just turning up and hearing some guy preach on a Sunday. That's truly being there for each other uh, when times are tough. That's a good word. And I'll just uh, point out one more thing to the readers. Uh, I mean, this point of uh, community and a complimentary uh, point, which is uh, the need for hospitality, that there's oh, community yeah. and hospitality in the LGB uh, community and T community. Uh, recommend Rosaria Butterfield's book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I think it's a beautiful and uh, compelling appeal for Christians to live in community and to be hospitable and that it's our actions and not merely our words that will draw people in. Often our words, you know, people have a dif difficulty even understanding our words. They, they load our words with freight that we would never intend. 
because they don't they don't understand what our words mean. But sometimes our actions can help illumine our words. So, uh, Carl, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And for those of you who are watching, thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to go to Amazon.com or Lifeway.com to pre-order The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Uh, we go live noon every Tuesday on the Facebook page at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And our videos are archived at my YouTube channel, uh, Bruce Ashford. We hope that you'll join us again soon on the public square and everything in it. Take care. Have a great day.